Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, introducing this uh, wonderful new series, uh, uh, The Architecture of Place, uh, collaboration between the ICAA, Intbau, and the Princess Foundation. Uh, this series of talks is a collaboration between these three organizations and focuses on the uh, built environment and its impact on the health of individuals, communities, and the planet. Uh, established and emerging voices will speak on their work uh, to create a better built future, something we can all look forward to. This afternoon's talk is entitled, Filling the Missing Middle of the Housing Market. And joining us today will be Alireza Segarchi, Dan Parolek, Robbie Kerr, and Jason Civicse. Uh, this group will discuss the fundamental reality across the globe that we need to provide more homes and we need to find the ways to do this that benefit communities without harming the environment. Our speakers will outline the concept of missing middle housing and how traditional methods of design can create better places to live for everyone. Moderating today's session will be Alireza Segarchi, uh, who is a principal at Stancoke Gate Architecture. He is an internationally renowned architect and a leading practitioner and exponent of contemporary classical architecture and traditional urban design. During his professional career, he has been responsible for major master planning and building projects in the UK, Europe, North America, and the Middle East. His projects have received awards and have been widely published and exhibited. Our speakers are Robbie Kerr, who is a director at Adam Architecture, a leading practice specializing in classical and traditional architecture and urban design. He has designed a variety of projects, including new private homes in the UK and overseas, the restoration of historic buildings, and new housing developments. Daniel Parolek is an urban designer and architect and the founding principal of Opticos Design, a founding B Corporation focused on urban placemaking, innovating housing design and policy, and zoning reform for walkable urbanism. Dan has championed the Missing Middle Housing Movement, launched missingmiddlehousing.com, and wrote the book Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to respond to today's housing crisis. He has a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Notre Dame, and a Master of Urban Design from the University of California at Berkeley. Jason Civicse is an urban planner, currently completing his PhD in urban and regional planning at the University of Alberta. As the managing director of the downtown Winnipeg BIZ and community planner with HTFC Planning and Design, Jason has helped to nurture safer, resilient, and inclusive communities through the creative placemaking and participatory planning. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. I think I won't really go over the CVs of the various speakers. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Dan Parolek of Opticus to basically start his presentation. Dan, please. Well, good afternoon, morning, and evening to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be part of this discussion today about missing middle housing. The title of my presentation today is intended to establish a foundation for this conversation. The title is Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to Today's Housing Crisis. And what we've seen across the United States, North America, and even around the world is that there's a tremendous and growing gap between the types of housing that households want and need and what is being delivered. And missing middle housing can provide a really great solution or be part of a very thoughtful solution to filling this gap and responding to this crisis. Uh, most of the content for my presentation are extracts from my book with the same title. And I do encourage you all to tweet while you're listening to this. My Twitter address is at Opticos Design, and I encourage you also to use the hashtag Missing Middle Housing. We used to know how to effectively deliver these housing types uh, that provided choices for households of all income levels in really great neighborhoods. And this example here is a streetscape in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States with two flats and three flats, which make up about 27% of Chicago's housing stock. 
And what these housing types did in Chicago is a similar story to cities across the country and really around the globe is they provided the opportunity for hardworking blue collar households to build equity and to build household stability and maybe even move their way up to another neighborhood with a larger home. But what we've done is we've systematically put layer upon layer of barriers in place for the delivery of these housing types. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through my presentation. So why is this topic such an important topic? And a lot of this is sort of statistics based on our experience in the U.S., but we've seen similar trends really around the world that there's really been a tremendous shift in household demographics and the compositions of households, including the fact that one third of all households in the United States are single persons. And you can imagine as architects, developers, planners, decision makers, what impact that has on the types of housing that we need to be delivering. And we can say that a third of houses on the market and being delivered are not designed specifically for these um, single person household. There's also is a growing demand for walkable living. Two thirds of the millennial generation and one third of baby boomers walkable living and a large percentage of that market actually wants missing middle housing specifically. And right, there's an affordable housing crisis that's rapidly growing. And in the United States, over a third of households in 2017 were housing costs burdened, which means that they were spending more than 30% of their household income on just housing. And so it's a problem that we're seeing continue to grow, continue to spread, and really um, becoming a a problem in, in cities around the world, regardless of size. And the other thing that I often like to talk about because it's inherent in a big part of our work is that our regulatory system is really broken. It's out of date. We're now up in the United States operating with a zoning system that's almost 100 years old. And we really need to think very differently about it because the system that's in place cannot even effectively tell the difference between these two very different housing designs and solutions that one on the left, right, is a positive benefit of fourplex in a neighborhood and the one on the right really detracts from the quality of the built environment, obviously, but most zoning systems do not identify those as being different. So what is missing middle housing? Missing middle housing is a term that I coined in 2011, sort of after much research and application of these housing types in our practice, both architecture and urban design. In 2012, we at Opticos Design created the missing middle diagram that many of you have probably seen. It's being used very broadly um, as part of a smart growth compendium publication. And then in 2016, Due to the strong interest in this topic, we launched missingmiddlehousing.com. And then earlier this year, my book was published on the topic, and it was really great to reach that milestone. But how we define missing middle housing are house scale buildings with multiple units in walkable neighborhoods. Those are the duplexes, the fourplexes, the cottage courts, the Manson apartments, the townhouses that exist between the scale of single family detached houses and the larger four, five, six plus story apartments and condo buildings that were a core part of neighborhoods really prior to the 1940s and were delivering a really broad range of housing choices. And this concept has really become a movement, which is really exciting to see. There's a broad application of missing middle housing in planning across Australia, including this adapted version of the diagram from the planning staff, the state of New South Wales, Toronto, the diagram on the bottom, and I know Edmonton's also having a robust, Jason, talk a little bit about that discussion about missing middle. But where we see missing middle housing falling into the spectrum and discussion about affordable housing is right in between sort of what we call capital A affordable housing, which is the subsidized and this desire to increase the supply to help address affordability. And what missing middle housing did historically and is doing currently and can be a great tool in delivering what we call affordability by design, or we often call attainability. And there's some really great case studies in my book that show how that can be delivered. And why do we call it missing? This is a really great statistic that I found as I was doing research for my book that less than 10% of housing units produced between 1990 and 2013 in the United States fit into this missing middle housing category, which we define as 19 units or less per building. So you can see there's been a pretty rapid and steady decline since the late 1970s for a variety of different reasons that we could talk about for many hours. So big cities have great stocks of missing middle, medium-sized city like Pasadena have great uh, historic missing middle 
neighborhoods. And then some of the oldest cities in the United States have great missing metal types like New Orleans. And what we as architects, urbanists can understand here is that even though the architecture and the typologies adapt based on climate and culture of these different areas, there is a shared set of characteristics and palette of missing metal types in all of these communities. And so a part of this research and education and work we've been doing with missing metal housing is really about emphasizing the importance of understanding this broad range of housing types that fall into this missing middle category and shifting conversations away from these abstracts and somewhat intimidating concepts like density and even terms like multifamily that tend to come with a lot of baggage and shift it to a conversation and a planning approach and system that focuses on the types. So we have systematically documented these types over the past 20 years in photographs, as well as in sort of physical documentations and drawings. And in the book and on the website, we present each of these types in what we call the idealized versions of both LE loaded or LE parked versions, as well as front loaded versions in contexts and communities that don't have alleys within them. And so the application has actually been very broad and is growing very rapidly, both with public sector application and with private sector uh, developers. And I just wanted to give some highlights of this application. And so 2019 was really a banner year for the application of missing middle in the public sector, the city, and even the statewide scale, the city of Minneapolis. I'm sure many of you have read about this eliminated single family zoning citywide and allow up to three units or the triplex on every lot as a way to get ahead of their affordable housing issues that they're facing and that are continuing to grow. Also last year, the state of Oregon adopted very aggressive HB 2001 legislation that also allows up to either uh, two units or four units, depending on the size of the city on any lot, including those that are currently zoned for single family. And cities across the country and counties and regions are integrating missing middle into their comprehensive planning processes. Here are three very different types of applications. Uh, City of Memphis, the island of Kauai, and Cincinnati that over the course of the last six to eight years have made missing middle housing a core part of that comprehensive planning uh, policy that these plans are envisioning and implementing. Um, We in our practice have created this methodology over the course of the last five years in particular, where we work with in a very focused efforts with counties and cities to identify and prioritize where missing middle housing applications should happen and also identify the specific barriers in place in terms of policy and zoning and otherwise that they need to remove to enable missing middle housing. And right, there's been a movement and including in our work and a lot of our colleagues to create this new operating system within our zoning practices based on form and placemaking where we embed these missing middle types uh, directly into the new zoning districts. And this is just an example from a form-based code we wrote for Cincinnati, Ohio, that will ultimately apply to 42 neighborhoods across Cincinnati uh, to enable good urbanism and this broad range of housing types. Um, In terms of private sector, there's some really creative things happening. This is a case study in the book, the conversion of in Portland, Oregon of a single family detached house into a fourplex with four stacked units. Um, We have been challenging ourselves and I encourage you all to do as well to work with larger uh, production scale builders in this instance, a builder who historically built apartments to sort of help them in the transitions of actually delivering neighborhoods as opposed to just projects in clustered housing. And so this is a project in the Omaha, Nebraska metro that will be the first complete missing middle neighborhood in the country. It's now 132 units in and performing extremely well. Uh, for our client. And you can just see some examples of five plex here, four plex in the upper top, and then the live work unit, which provides the ground floor flexible space or a neighborhood main street to deliver walkability. Um, We've also worked with large scale. It's an atypical client type for us, but challenged ourselves to work uh, with large scale production builders. In this instance, delivering the Muse housing type that our client was able to deliver at a price point about 25,000 American dollars less than their typical tuck under townhouse. Uh, This is just a site plan where we showed in terms of placemaking, we split two large blocks into four micro blocks and created that pedestrian only muse and a community space as a focal point in the middle. 
We're working now on what will be the largest car-free community in the country at this missing middle scale as well. It's in Tempe, Arizona, it's called Cul-de-Sac Tempe. I encourage you to just Google it. It was featured in the New York Times business section just a week ago. And this particular project just shows the importance of responding to the climate and the context, and it delivers desert responsive urbanism, architecture, and housing types. A really interesting um, case study, and there's strong interest and growing interest. And I just, in terms of international application, we did a really great project with the Princess Foundation that was a sustainable growth strategy for Libreville, the capital of Gabon. And these missing metal types were inherent and they were adapted to the tropical context. And we worked with a very talented team, including Chrysolis Architecture based out of Panama City, Panama, and showed how these types could be. Um, sort of adapted to the tropical climate, but also be flexible in terms of incorporating, you know, larger homes, multiple smaller units, or even commercial spaces within the larger uh, vision of the growth strategy. So a couple of concluding thoughts is I think really in terms of this conversation we're having today is just like, how can we think creatively about removing barriers for the allowance of this broad range of housing types that households need and want, and even just more broadly for effective and organic and creative solutions to delivering housing and delivering urbanism in, in high quality places. I just want to mention that you can uh, buy my book at opticosdesign.com. It's now available if you use my last name, you just do a screenshot, you can get a 20% discount. Um, there's also really good information at missingmiddlehousing.com. And what I would just say in closing is that we as architects, we as planners, uh, if, if there's developers on the line, maybe even decision makers, each of us plays a really important role in the delivery of these housing choices. And we all need to really step up and think creatively about um, providing solutions to this much needed housing. Thank you. So um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining me. I'm Jason. I work at the city of Edmonton. I'm here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So I do want to acknowledge that I am speaking from Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Blackfoot uh, peoples. And for me, it's really important for us to uh, acknowledge the land that we are on, especially as urban planners working towards reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Dan mentioned how he had created that missing middle illustration and typology. And I think that if he had copyrighted that, he would be a very, very rich man. Uh, but we do thank him for inspiring us with that typology. Uh, and I think, you know, as we have seen, and it's hard not to acknowledge that, you know, there are some really challenging times right now with COVID, but really what we've seen is a lot of racial and social inequities and housing, of course, has been part of that big conversation. I think I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to quickly go through a few slides just to sort of respond. And I think Dan provided a really great capture and, and overview of why missing middle is important. So I'm not really going to go through that, but take you through what the city of Edmonton is doing and how we're responding to uh, not only the housing crisis, but, you know, how do we welcome more people into our city? And so you saw that missing middle um, typology that Dan shared and the way that we interpret that typology as what's missing in our streetscape. So back in the 1940s and in response to uh, the large sort of booms and busts of our population after the world wars, um, there was a huge rush to be able to accommodate those new arrivals. So what we saw was a lot of these sort of California bungalow, single detached, single story homes. And then as we move forward, you also saw a lot of these high rise, um, taller buildings. And so what we define as sort of missing middle, everything that's grayed out in this illustration here. So everything from row housing to triplexes, fourplexes, fiveplexes, courtyard apartment housing, low rise to mid rise apartments. And our definition doesn't go above six stories. And I know that within other Canadian um, municipalities in their context, that the missing middle definition might be very different. So why are we focused on missing middle? For us, there was a bit of a chronology and a bit of a process that led us up to this point. It all started back in 2013, uh, where we created a community engagement and stakeholder process called Evolving Infill 1.0. Um, and that was a year long endeavor where we invited over a thousand Edmontonians to share with us um, how we might actually realize one of our municipal development plan goals, which was to spend for 25% of housing starts within our core mature neighborhoods. That 
ultimately resulted in what we call our infill roadmap 2014. And something to keep in mind that we had some significant um, political support that really enabled us to move forward the conversation. And a lot of these actions in the infill roadmap really focused on low density infill. And so some of the big uh, actions in that roadmap were allowing subdivision of 50 foot lots to 25 foot lots. Typical sort of width of a lot here in Edmonton is about 50 feet to 75 feet. So we enabled and changed our regulations and our zoning to allow for narrow lot homes on 25 foot lots. That sort of proliferated a lot of what we call narrow lot homes or skinny homes, and that really dominated the conversation at the time. A lot of folks were really upset about this, and so we put a lot of effort into communications and marketing really to show why infill is important and why that shift was necessary. We also created some changes to our zoning to allow for uh, laneway homes or what we call here garage suites. They used to be called garage suites and garden suites, and we've just sort of amalgamated them under one use class as garage suites. Um, We put a lot of resources in this first roadmap to really focus on construction compliance. So we know that that was a big pinch point for community members is, you know, we understand why info is important, but it's sort of a headache for us as we actually see it being built in our community. That being said, we created a design competition to really also um, generate some conversation around how low density info could be well designed. We know that that was another pinch point for community members was how the info actually looked. So in between 2014 to 2016, we put a lot of effort into communicating. People started to change their minds, though, because they started to see a lot more people moving into these new infills. And so the conversation then really changed in 2017 when people said, we understand why infill is important, but is it actually creating that affordability? And so we rebooted based on council's desire to do some more engagement. So we talked to over 4,000 Edmontonians from public institutions, businesses, residents, and community organizations. And they really uh, set the tone for us to focus on um, the missing middle, as Dan had identified, or those medium density housing forms. That ultimately arrived at creating our second info roadmap called Info Roadmap 2018, which turns its gaze to missing middle. And again, a design competition as a way to not only market why missing middle is important, but also to show how missing middle could be designed because it is absent in our streetscape today. Uh, And so we wanted to be able to prototype and show what that could look like. Here are 25 sort of actions in that info roadmap. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to just highlight some of the bold actions, which we called the big moves. And we called them big moves because council wanted us to be able to identify them as sort of having the most impact. Not to say that we wouldn't be completing all the actions, but it sort of gives us a prioritization. Some of the big things that we knew was really important was to address servicing and infrastructure. We know that for sort of one-to-one replacements for infill that our existing infrastructure and capacity can support those types of intensification goals. But when we want to see sort of five lots now turn to 56 units, you know, servicing could be a big challenge. So we actually are looking at how the city must invest in servicing and infrastructure, but we also created some pilot programs. So we actually have a cost share for um, hydrants and water main lines. Um, We actually are also rebalancing the processing times for development permits by actually expediting development permit applications and now building permit applications for class A or permitted uses for infill. Uh, Dan talked about integrating missing middle in our comprehensive planning or your official plans or municipal development plan. So some of these actions actually talk about prioritizing infill at key nodes and corridors. Something just to note is that we just approved public hearing at second reading our new municipal development plan, which actually focuses very, very much so on missing middle, actually upping the ante from 25% of infill in our current mature neighborhoods now to 50% um, over the next 40 years. And we're actually expecting a population growth of 1 million to 2 million people over the next 40 to 45 years that we're also going to be doing some major regulatory changes in our zoning to coincide with our new municipal development plan. We will actually rewrite our entire zoning bylaw uh, from start to finish to coincide with those broader policy objectives, which really focus on uh, medium density infill and missing middle, as well as, you know, expectations that the market will still start to build taller buildings as well as single detached, but really focusing some investments on the missing middle.
I'm going to quickly go through a couple more slides. So I talked about our municipal development plan and we actually orient our municipal development plan around five big city moves. These are basically what we're identifying them as city building outcomes. So there's greener as we grow, which, you know, sort of is intuitive that we want to be able to um, build in a way that is also sustainable. Catalyze and Converge is trying to support and nurture employment uh, and job creation, talent and innovation in our cities. Inclusive and compassionate. We want to make sure that our policies and our regulations are looking at how we build and how we grow from an equitable lens. A community of communities connects quite well to that global conversation around 15 minute districts or being able to access what you need within 15 minutes of a walk or active transportation. And then the fifth one is a rebuildable city, which really is about infill. It's intensification, really reimagining what we have today as we sort of rebuild for the needs of our future. I'm just going to quickly go through these slides. I talked about our missing middle infill design competition. Instead of it just being an ideas competition, we actually worked with our real estate department to find real parcels of land that we could actually tie to a competition that would invite architects and developers to work together. We worked with community members, which was really the cornerstone of the project. They actually helped to set the parameters for the height you know, what they would embrace, all those different criteria. And here are some of the ideas that were generated. We're actually working with the winning team now. We've offered the first right of refusal on the land. And now we're working with them through the actual development process, trying to expedite that, trying to understand at the same time what those pinch points are for the team so we can learn from that and also make changes to our regulations and our processes. Here are just some comments from the jury when we did the design comp that a lot of the designs that were generated really use rational planning techniques situated the building close to the sidewalk to encourage that connection to the streetscape. There was a minimum of 15 dwelling units in our criteria, but most of the submissions range from 30 to 60. Some of the housing typologies, we were expecting a lot of these, you know, bigger apartment blocks, but what we saw was more of an integration in gentle density or invisible density so that it could work within that context. A really mm -hmm. huge use of courtyards and amenity space. And that is my quick little scan. I think giving a European perspective is an optimistic one, but I'll try and do a UK perspective at the very least. Dan has provided a great starting point for this discussion. There's clearly the sort of two main elements of the missing middle. There's the architectural piece and there's the, the social piece as well. And I think it's probably in that social piece that during the course of this 10 minutes, I'd like to, to touch on. But first, I think it's probably just worth reflecting on where we are and, and how does it have relevance here. Of course, the same values as in the US and Canada, a common urbanism goal for recognising the value of people, places, sustainability, um, through built form, through a varied cross-section architecturally and socially, which all, of course, makes for better places. I think any urbanist or architect uh, should obviously aspire to that. On the two parts of the missing agenda, I think there are perhaps slightly differing issues in the UK. Clearly, we have policies such as the Green Belt, which limits the growth of some of our larger urban conurbations. There's less availability of land, which in places forces the, the value up and in turn has perhaps forced greater efficiency of the use of the land. However, that doesn't preclude the same extremes of development happening here as a standard developer uh, will naturally look to lift their bottom line profit as much as possible, often at the cost of uh, that missing middle. One might also say that they'll favour those bits that the uh, state agent sold well the last time. They'll pack them in, they'll pack them high. If they can, they'll get those big houses on their own big plots. You know, there are some strands which I think follow through from what we've been hearing from both Jason and from Dan. I'm actually going to try and also give a perspective outside of just London. There is uh, a bit more to the UK than London. In larger urban conurbations, the mansion block typology is perhaps something of a focus. I think I'm actually going to leave that there and perhaps there are questions later that we can touch on for that. I think it's worth, if I am going to focus on the social agenda, perhaps to paint the simplistic and perhaps pessimistic version of the UK development scene of developers laced with greed creating ghettos of affordable housing uh, located in the unfortunate and unfavourable parts of the site, again, labelling those who live there in false dawns or false ma manners. And I think importantly, rather than building on these complex communities, they take short-term horizons rather than stewardship of responsibility to the communities and to the people who live there uh, and the quality of homes that they're living. 
there was an interesting statistic that I managed to dig out. All good talks, I think, need a good statistic. The World Bank estimate that 95% of businesses are small uh, and medium-sized enterprises. That's fine, probably obvious. But their comment was that these companies support more jobs, they encourage diversification of an economic base, they promote innovation, they provide a powerful force of integration, and yet they also recognise that there's a massive gap of some $1 trillion credit to support these very businesses. So they recognise equally that economically and socially, this important middle um, also has a huge value. Now, I've talked of a standard developer, but luckily we are lucky to work with some more enlightened clients and developers along the way. With these developers and these clients that we're able to start to explore this social agenda of the missing middle uh, a bit further. It does sound ridiculous, but we do want to try and design places that people actually want to live in, not just be forced upon. There's a grounding that we need to base our work on, which is how communities are formed. And I perhaps turn to a, an analogy of, that one can find in, in nature, where we appreciate the complexity that can be found in its beauty. Inherently, there's something interesting, richer in the forest than a field of wheat. The complexity of layers of uh, the surrounding structures that come together, that support each other, I think can be found in, in the communities that we need to build. And so how do we actually go on doing this? I think we need to obviously look at the communities that we create. And again, Dan's book goes on much more detail on it. I highly recommend buying it. The amenity-rich, walkable communities. I think that really is a line in which we can focus on for a moment. Shifting nature of the way we live and work within our COVID fallout. If you pick up the trends of how my generation, the emerging millennials, um, are living, are working, the demonstrable proof that they are travelling and actually, I think now out of COVID, we'll find that obviously with home working, there's real opportunities to tie and live work in a less conventional manner, perhaps creating hubs around homes and giving financial impetus to create these amenity areas uh, that we can again turn to the benefit of those communities and look to the values that we can create. Uh, the other point then that touches within uh, the work Dan has looked at that Jason's touched on is that the importance of creating places with a variety of sizes of units of tenure um, of course, gives an opportunity for a more diverse ownership. It helps with both the affordability and I think that important line, the attainability of properties. And the work that we're doing with some of these developers is looking at creating more pepper-potted, uh, tenure-blind mixes of affordable housing, recognising that within that balance of affordability comes a richer community that can learn from each other. And whilst um, I'm not aware of any academic research, certainly the empirical evidence of the community values that this creates, this approach to development creates, is improved. For those who play golf, and I don't, we tend to take a view when we look at the architecture of these buildings, it's a bit like a game of golf that, you know, you might shoot over par and spend a bit more money on a couple of those key buildings. It's important to do. But by the time you get round your round of golf, you've probably broken par. Or if you're uh, the financial manager of your developer, probably uh, hopefully a little bit under. So it's important to get those street scenes obviously right. But again, it's a gentle density, gives that mix across the developments. Now, I don't have a huge amount of time to um, run through a very quick working example, but I am going to take you through a canter on this. Hopefully the screen share will catch up. What we have is a development in uh, the south of England in a place called called Newquay, which is owned by the Dutch of Cornwall. This is a scheme for 4,000 homes, 4,000 new workplaces. There's a new high street, but it's an extension to an existing town. At its heart is walkable neighbourhoods. These concentric circles are familiar to many of you. They have 400 metre radiuses from local centres with a district centre at its heart. Essentially, at its very heart of developing this master plan, we have those key walkable neighbourhoods. So then taking down one of these phases, you can see within this pattern of phase one, we have a whole variety of sizes and tenures from apartment blocks of mixed use up in the northern quarters and easing that density through. And that, of course, comes through in these drawings, which show the size of units, which range from apartments through to three and four beds down to the smaller ones. That's all fine. You then start to look at how we come to that social agenda of pepper potting the affordable housing through the scheme so that you get that. Uh, rich tapestry. You look at the size and height, again, to give greater variety. All of these ha things help start to build those communities. And just to give you a very quick flavour of the variety, again, some of these key buildings with brick or local stone, you can really start to put the value in the right place. 
And at the end of the day, one hopes that it can start to create better places. So in conclusion, I think we should recognise the social value that can be generated. The 4B Commission, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission here in the UK has recognised that the work that Charlie Dugdale at Knight Frank has done of analysing the uplift in financial value and the social value, better designed places with a cohesive community at their heart can deliver for our clients. And whilst this missing middle is now only being done by a small number of people, and it's great to be part of this discussion, the more of these schemes that we can encourage, the more of these stakeholders who we can encourage to engage in this better way of designing, the more opportunity there is for those who are actually buying these properties to use their muscle of consumer buying power. It's important that recognising that successful urbanism, the missing middle can provide, will broadly build more complex layers in communities, create better places that have a social conscience and can provide more inclusive, mutually supporting, better places to live. Thank you. I will now ask the Q&A session to start. Dan has been working and breathing and living in the missing middle for quite a while now and showed the potential of different typologies and the benefits of actually looking into different, exploring different typologies. Jason, on the other hand, showed us how this can work on a kind of a city-wide level and what are the challenges of rolling something like that out from the theory of how one can create these types and how they would work normatively. And Robbie showed us a polycentric development, which is really not to do with densification or intervention into an existing urban sense and remediating it, which is more or less what I can see was happening in Edmonton or what Dan is focusing on. I'm just wondering, is this strategy that Dan has so eloquently uh, described, and I wonder how it's working within a traditional city context? In order for the application to be truly effective, it needs to work both and be very thoughtfully applied to both for the evolution of existing urban sort of downtown adjacent urban neighborhoods, as well as for cities that have defined growth areas of how a city can thoughtfully grow at its edges. So I think it absolutely needs to apply to both. I don't think it's one or the other. And, you know, it is really interesting. It's the concept is absolutely sort of inherent in sort of our conversations about just good urbanism generally. But I think the thing that just the terminology and even the diagram did is it was about how to effectively communicate this idea and this need for this broad range of housing choices to a broader, even a less technical audience. And it has been successful in doing that. Robbie, do you think this is a kind of a byproduct of what we've inherited in terms of our urban realm? Or is it actually a strategy for densification from get-go? I hadn't touched on the um, urban consideration of it, but it is important providing the houses that we need. And I think certainly within our cities, there has been a history of suburbanization that has created, that you can recognise many of the patterns that both Dan and Jason have described. And if we are to try and meet our housing targets, if we're going to meet, try and deal with this housing issue, then some form of gentle densification is going to be required. And there have been many people who have used the typology of the mansion block, which has been used uh, very successfully, impressively high density. There are people that are looking at doing some quite dramatic changes of densifying some of the suburban areas, which I think will terrify local residents, but again, is important. And so, yes, I think the strategies of what is being described from an architectural perspective of identification is a very important part of looking at things in a more urban context. But again, I do also think it has to come back to not just densifying for the sake of creating housing numbers, but also what impact that's going to have on the communities that exist around there. There is a question uh, which I'm going to read um, that's coming, a few questions coming in now. One from uh, Luan Fernandez says, the world will face a very grave economic crisis due to COVID. How the middle missing housing policies can help governments in this upcoming situation? It's a common question, obviously, these days. I think that one of the other great aspects of missing middle housing and neighborhoods, we, we started calling them middle neighborhoods where these types are inherent, is they have responded very well to delivering a high quality of life to their residents, even in 
uh, these times of COVID with social distancing requirements and sheltering in place. And I feel like it gives the residents just enough elbow room uh, to sort of be able to get outside. You know, there's typically a small private open space, sort of private porch or stoop space that you can get outside. There's no long shared corridors that you have to worry about sort of getting too close to your neighbors, no shared elevators. There's walkability, like the ability to walk out your door and walk down a tree-lined street. Like in the United States, if you're living in a suburban context, right, you're walking through a parking lot in a multifamily apartment project or along a street that is not comfortable. So I feel like these missing middle neighborhoods, these middle neighborhoods were in high demand prior to COVID. And I think post-COVID, they'll even be in stronger demand because they do provide that in between that's missing in the media conversation between sort of the Manhattan, sort of the urban and the suburban, like it provides a choice in the middle of that conversation that has effectively proven high quality living even during COVID. Can you just explain whether in his experience with Edmonton has COVID really started people thinking differently? Because one obviously gets completely wound up in one's own era, but there've been wars, famines, pestilence for generations and cities have endured in their current forms, and one can't say they've been completely defined by any disaster. What is your experience, Jason? Yeah, and I just want to build on the comments, and these are great questions and great discussion. I don't know if you've ever been to Canada or been to Edmonton, Alberta, but we have a pretty dispersed, auto-oriented city where we have a lot of land. We saw a lot of suburban sprawl, but what we are seeing with you know the city of Edmonton is a lot of great political will and community support for intensification targets. So when thinking about sort of Dan's point about how we grow sustainably, before we used to identify infill based on uh, the age of the home. So it's either a home before 1970, you were a mature neighborhood, anything after 1970 was an established neighborhood. We are now moving away from that by getting away from that by saying intensification should be everywhere, uh, but it should also be well-designed. And we're also thinking about how we retrofit sort of existing community malls that have sort of run its life cycle in terms of use and utilization. Um, In terms of like the question about how are governments responding, obviously during this time, you know, there's limited budgets and resources around to be able to support the way that we have been growing. So it is about prioritizing areas and thinking about how we grow with the infrastructure that we have. And also realizing that the regulations that we create also deliver high returning outcomes. And so we've seen that with, um, you know, the changes to our zoning, we've abolished single family only zoning. And then we've also seen now how the development industry has been able to uh, leverage and create some innovation there. And kind of on the social aspect, we know that with COVID, people had a desire for connectedness. And we saw that with the designs that there are, you know, amenity areas and courtyards for people to be able to connect and gather. And then on the environmental side of things, you know, our building codes are changing based on middle and so you're starting to see in some of our preliminary research on climate change show that for a one-for-one replacement you actually reduce your embodied carbon which reduces the greenhouse gas emissions and we obviously need to do more research on that Uh, but also we are changing building codes and so with redevelopment Mm -hmm. you're also seeing some better outcomes there yeah i think that has actually answered a couple of questions one from Kathleen watkins exactly about how what should we do whether it's only an interesting question has come up from darren size which says Retail spaces and traditional high streets are changing, mainly because of technology and all sorts of other issues, especially now with economic downturn. Um, and and how, what opportunities do we see in kind of rethinking those areas? Because obviously, this is not just about numbers. It's about placemaking. It's about community. We're talking about walkable community to centers. If these centers are disappearing before our eyes, how is that going to affect our strategy in, in, in planning? I think there is a real opportunity to look at the living patterns of people who are inhabiting our settlements, to use that broader sense. The way we live in our houses in a post-COVID world may well not be quite as dramatic a change. I think the value of open space probably will. But in terms of the way we work and travel, I think there's an opportunity to start to 
layer up different uses so you can start to put your nursery next to some flexible hub spacing for offices so an office isn't just an open plan office it's a series of rentable rooms you know you could use the sort of uber-esque technology of renting a room for a couple of hours to avoid the other person who's endlessly on zoom and just won't shut up you put a cafe next to it or you put some retail next to it you can start to get a greater footfall in there than you might historically have got by people commuting out longer distances, you're holding people there. So I think with some quite clever design, there's a chance to use the shifting patterns of of, uh, life that come out of COVID, of shifting perceptions of where we value our time being spent, not necessarily commuting, to reinvigorate our traditional retail and concepts, perhaps reinvigorate our town centres again. I feel that... I think just sort of rooting this all back into sort of learning from historic urban patterns. And I think the great thing about learning from those patterns is we know that these good urban places evolve and adapt over time. It's not a stagnant sort of environment. And so I feel that even in times where, you know, the viability of retail in those main streets may be challenging, I think those spaces can adapt to accommodate you know, the incubation of the broad range of small businesses that fall into that category that Robbie mentioned earlier, I think just as a really important incubation process, they could even potentially be live workspaces of what we're seeing. We've designed high streets or main streets that have flex space on the ground floor so that they can function as residential or the market demand is not proven, but they can easily adapt to be commercial or sort of service related uses in our project in Nebraska, the missing middle neighborhood. I thought it was a real stretch in the short term that commercial uses would show up in those spaces because it's a fairly suburban context, but a pizza shop, a yoga studio and a small coffee shop have already shown up with only a hundred residents in the neighborhood. So I think it's just with these types of patterns that we all practice, it allows for the evolution and organic adaptation of these communities. Um, Robert Adams asked an interesting question. He says, in the UK, middle income design is the majority of the market and is well served in standard suburban development. I suppose it's the same in, in the US. Is it that the middle is missing in housing delivery or is it really that the middle is missing in good urban design? Uh, I think it's in the United States, it's both. It's not one or the other. Even the large production home builders have not been delivering houses at price points that a middle income family can attain. And um, that's partly due to just, especially the last five years, really rapidly increasing costs related to everything from land to materials to labor and entitlement. So it is really important to introduce these missing middle types into the vocabulary and the portfolio of these builders to enable them to achieve these middle class price points and the Muse housing we did kind of demonstrated that. But I do feel like, yeah, absolutely, there's a good urban design missing from conventional development as well as even, right, it's, it doesn't make sense to have a good housing type and place it within a community that's not well planned. So we see a lot of that as well. I think it's really making sure there's a focus both on the typology, the housing types, as well as just the placemaking and the good urban design and master planning. Yeah, I think missing middle probably means two different things, does it? In a highly urbanized environment, it actually means increasing uh, density and occupation per hectare by building up necessarily, not necessarily building in between by extending upwards. Whereas in the suburban context, it has a completely different meaning and it needs to come up with new typologies to actually complete the kind of verbal fabric. Yeah, and a lot of people misunderstand when they sort of engage in the missing middle conversation is that this isn't about us saying that everything should be two or three stories only or four stories. Like this is about we need higher intensity urbanism in defined locations as well as the smaller scale, sort of this middle scale, missing middle, it's not one or the other either. And I think people misconstrue this conversation a lot of times as us promoting only sort of this two, three, four story. This is absolutely a scale that's missing from the lexicon of most uh, planners, architects, urban designers, and absolutely missing from most zoning codes 
actually across North America, really. That brings us to a very interesting question, actually. Maybe it's a problem of education. Simona Lucinetti has asked, how do we bring the knowledge of human scale, pedestrian urban planning back into our architecture faculties and universities? I really like how Dan phrased it that we're really trying to introduce a new vocabulary and really educate uh, the public about why the missing middle is important. And a big part of that is ensuring that people know how missing middle is defined in your city. And what we've seen is that, you know, Dan's illustration has been repurposed and contextualized based on the municipality. And so um, for the city of Edmonton, at least, you know, that was a big reason for a design competition was really to generate a conversation about why missing middle is important in our city, but also how it could be well designed, because that's been a big conversation for us is like, we understand why it feels important, but it doesn't quite integrate well within our community as, you know, the big conversation right now. So that was a big part of our city perspective, really trying to educate and communicate to the public about the why the info imperative why it's important and uh, how we could do it now the connection to architecture faculties and universities you know I actually think that students are thinking about these conversations in their studios in planning and architecture and certainly within the Canadian context a lot of the planning and architecture faculties are trying to integrate their disciplines so now you're seeing architects trying to you know play around with different housing typologies and you have planners who are looking at the higher level policy and regulatory frameworks and then you might have interior designers now thinking about those amenities on the inside that can help intergenerational living and those types of priorities as well as your landscape architects who are thinking about you know those public and semi-private um, spaces so I think that integration is important but I also think that connection to the real world is really important and that's certainly what I'm seeing in Edmonton is that with the University of Alberta and it's not just me just trying to give them a shout out but you know I think that they really do this is they've connected now with the city of Edmonton on real life scenarios and problems and questions that need practical solutions that are of course grounded in some theory but also how does it actually work uh, in real time. And so certainly on my team, on the info work that we're doing, we're connecting with university students on how we actually roll out our policies and what are sort of those theoretical connections to confirm and reinforce the work that we're doing. And we're doing that right now with our zoning bylaw. You know, we're thinking about how we actually um, embed and apply equity considerations into the way in which we build policy and regulations. The city of Edmonton and our planners have some thoughts and assumptions about how we might do that, but you know, how does that connect to academia? And so we're actually connected with them. They're actually gonna help us audit our process and come along with us along the journey. So that would say better integration between disciplines, better integration with our municipalities and those who are doing that policy work on the ground floor. And of course, I know that private firms are often working with universities too on mentorship, and that's important as well. Another question which uh, has just come in, it says, oftentimes it seems very difficult to secure funding for the smaller scale development that suits missing middle housing. What strategies have you found successful in convincing developers and financial backers that this is a necessary and viable building model? I think, Robbie, you obviously are working on this very large development that you just showed us. How is it working in terms of the developers? Because you talked about the developers' profit uh, and land values. I mean, essentially, that is what's going to drive most of these developments. We can all talk of the social context, but the people who are doing it are also, on the whole, 90% of them. And I think it's a very good question. It's difficult to persuade people, but there is a growing body of completed work that shows that by perhaps taking a smaller receipt out of something at the beginning and working in a more collaborative way with development partners, by being clever with the way that you spend the money that you have in the urban realm, you can actually start to deliver better values and returns on it and in turn demonstrate that the more conventional ways of doing development isn't the only way of doing it. Common aspiration agreements between partners is a method that's been used bringing the um, variety of smaller regional developers together who might otherwise not have had access to these sites but it does also help having a, a client who can take a longer term view on these things so there isn't a magic bullet 
It is often hard to get funding for the smaller projects in particular because there's not typically a comparable in the market that a bank makes a bank comfortable to prove the value of the sale or the ultimate rental value. But um, I would say there's some creative things happening. Um, there's a lot of private equity right now that's because of this big demand and the gap that is being focused on this missing middle scale. There's crowdfunding efforts. Uh, if you go to a site called Small Change, there are small missing middle scale projects that are sort of going through a crowdfunding process to raise uh, capital for their projects. And so I think there's creative ways around that, but it's, it's not always easy to do. And I will acknowledge that. And the other thing is just there's a lot of education, even with local banks, a lot of times to help them understand the nature of risk or lack of risk in doing these smaller projects at the missing middle scale. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much for your contribution.